I think you probably agree with me that our speakers today probably don't need an introduction. We have benefited from their care and oversight and direction here at SVU since they arrived in 2014. In 2006, their family moved to Ghana, West Africa, to spend a year working on a medicine to fight malaria. They have been blessed with four amazing children, two sons and two daughters. They love the people and the sense of community that they have found here at Southern Virginia University. And we'll turn the time over to President and Diane Wilcox. Let me put that there. Oops. We on? We on? Put aside. Good morning, everyone. Let me, ask, let me ask you all a question. How many of you have ever been to Africa? A lot. That's, that's a few. Okay, we're all going to go today. When, uh, back on your mission. <laughs> there are some, there's some context that I'd like to set for this discussion to start with. And this is... Can you see? Can I see? No, no, I wonder if they could see. <laughs> but can you? I can see you. Good, good, there you have it. <laughs> Only you. <laughs> we... <laughs> Don't, en <laughs> Don't encourage him. Okay. When Ariel asked how many people were madly in love. I made Reed raise his hand. <laughs> I stuck it up. <laughs> I did. So we, we went to Africa as a family, as Annie said, in, in 2006. This was in connection with work that we were doing in the early days of our pharmaceutical company, Clean Nanomedicine. We had developed a new treatment for malaria, and we were doing preclinical research in connection with that with the, the Noguchi Center for Tropical Diseases at the University of Ghana. While we were there, we had an opportunity to get to know a lot of the people in Ghana, and in particular, some of the research we were doing was up at a small village up on the Volta River. This village is called Asutswari, and you'll see its name up here once or twice. This is a village of about 2,000 people. There are a series of, a network of villages around Asutswari. There are 25,000 people that live in, in, in surrounding villages that are within 10 or 12 miles. And this place was chosen for the medical research because there was, there was a midwife who had a practice there. She was the medical community for all of these 25,000 people. And you'll meet her. So the research was being done because malaria in particular uh, is deadly for very young children, for infants, and for pregnant women. This has to do with the way the immune system develops. So while we were working in this, in this village of Asichwari, we felt there was a need for our family, all of the kids were with us and Diane, we felt like we wanted to do something besides the, the research we were, we were doing with the company. So the, basically Rachel and Lincoln and Dallin and, and Madeline, Madeline was really not with us, but we, we put together a, an idea to develop a, a rural medical center and a maternity clinic and raise the money to do this. Uh, the bad news is there's nothing there. The good news is it doesn't cost very much to do things. That was to get your attention. So, so you'll see some, some of what's happening there. What you see behind me is the Volta River. This is looking out from the bank in Asichwari. And these are fishermen. Now, here's, here is something about, about 
I'm going to stand in the middle. Yeah, I think the middle's good. <laughs> Here's, here is some context about Africa. Africa is huge. And the distances are enormous. This, we're going to compare Africa to the United States. This is Africa. That's the whole United States. It's enormous. It takes as long to fly from London to Ghana, where we were here, as it does to fly from Ghana to Cape Town. It's just, this is an enormous continent. And it's also very complex. This is a map of language and nation, nations, tribals, tribes, tribal nations. So these are tribes that have been here for a long time and they tend to follow linguistic patterns. And overlaid on it in black are the colonial established boundaries of the current countries. So you studied about nation states. A nation state is where a nation corresponds to a state. There are no nation states. Um, the closest thing to a nation state probably is, is Egypt. But in sub-Saharan Africa, there just isn't. And in Ghana, there are 12 different dialects, languages. But because of the colonial heritage, the common language is English. English is the official language, but it's the second language for everyone. That's the heritage of a colonial um, structure here. So this is Ghana, this piece right here, the sort of squarish one there, rectangular. And that's where we were. It's larger here. This is West Africa. Now. Here is an important question. A lot of people who have not lived in Africa have a perception that Africa is sort of per perennially underachieving. That people are maybe not very motivated or don't want to work hard or whatever, but it's kind of underachieving and that's why it's less developed than other parts of the world. What I believe after living there is that the people of Africa are overachieving because of the infrastructure that they're working with. And as that changes, you will see a new Africa come. And I'm going to show you a few examples here. One is education. In Ghana, and Ghana is one of the strongest countries in West Africa, it is certainly one of the most stable. In Ghana, you can go to school until sixth grade, which means you can basically learn to read and write and do basic arithmetic. After that, you have to pay to go to school. That has all sorts of implications for the level of education that most people have. Here's another thing, is the, the, the transport system. If you think about the way companies work, the way money is made, the way development happens. If you don't have good roads, it's very difficult. And there aren't very many good roads. And generally the, infra the infrastructure is not developed for transportation because the roads are not well developed. Now there are roads, but there are very, the, the, the amount of roads relative to the, the number of cars is small. The number of cars in general is small. But in the cities where, where, the, where the cars live with the, with the people, there aren't enough roads. Um, here's another thing that we just take for granted is credit and the ability to use credit cards to transact business, to do things, to buy things, to go to the restaurant. There basically is no credit. And money doesn't work quite the same way. This is about half of the money that, that the kids raised for this uh, laboratory and maternity clinic. Those are $100 bills, that's $13,000. We had to go to the bank and trade it to Ghanaian money to use it to pay the contractors. That's the Ghanaian money. That's, that's the exact translation of that much money. So the whole system 
is complicated and, and difficult to work with. We assume we have water. This is Asutswari. Do you see how they're getting water? There's a truck that's come with water. Now there, there also is, is, a, is a well, but it's slow. And then you can go to the river and get water. And you can imagine what that might be like. Sewers. That's the sewer behind this little girl. So all these things that are, that are in the infrastructure, including the rule of law. Ghana is a more lawful country than almost any place in Sub-Saharan Africa and more stable. But routinely people don't respect the law. And I mean, you can, this is not something you'd see happening in Germany, right? Um, the rule of law is fundamental to the ability to develop. So all of these things contribute to this important thing that life expectancy is just way lower. Across West Africa, it varies from an average of 50 years to 60 years compared to 80 in the United States and Europe. And that's a, there are a number of reasons for that. A lot of it is disease and accident, but they're also, they're, they're wars. And serious accidents on these, on these roads. Now, back to this question. Is, is Africa underachieving or overachieving? I believe that if we took Americans, all of us, and put us in Ghana, and in place of the Ghanaians who are living there. I think these people are overachieving. And what you're going to see is these are very hardworking, industrious, ambitious people, and they're dealing with tremendous difficulties. But they're going to make it. And Africa is part of the future. What we found were very clean, self-reliant, kind, grateful people. Those are important words for us here. And we've been talking about them, about being clean, being self-reliant, being kind. And what you'll see is beautiful people with beautiful smiles. And I'm going to introduce you to some just quickly here. These are, these are people we knew. Um, and I want you to pay attention right here as we're looking at these. I said clean. Do you know how they clean their clothes? Think they have a washing machine? They don't have a washing machine. In this place, they go to the river. And how do they iron their clothes? They have, a, they have an old iron-shaped, anvil-shaped piece of metal with a handle that they heat on a grill over a fire. That's how they press it. There, there, there is no electric iron for the vast majority of these people. And these people live in a very poor area. But look, look at their clothes. They're not, there's, a, there's, there's an old Stevie Wonder song where he says, he's talking about a girl that's growing up in the ghetto and he says, her clothes are old, but never are they dirty. And that, you'll see this as a pattern here. These are guys going to manual labor and they're all clean. This is a delivery guy. This is the daily water. The little boy has malaria and his brother is taking care of him. And these, this one is taking his younger brother to school. There's a great story about this little girl that Diane oh, do you want me may to tell have time it? to share. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to do it now or later? You can. Yeah, why don't you? We've got I can. There. All right. This was one of the sweet little girls that lived up in the Asut Soiree, and she had been really helpful uh, when we were doing work up there in the clinic. So one day we brought up some uh, pencils and some cookies and gave them to her, and she ran away. 
and we didn't know where she'd gone. And in you know, two or three minutes, she came back with all the children in the village. They all came running. I mean, she had 10 of them, and they all okay. came running after her. And she shared everything she had with them. She wouldn't think of just having it by herself. No one goes hungry in Ghana. Everybody has enough. So she had 24 cookies. She took one. And the other 23 kids got. Yeah. Everybody got. Yeah, it's and a wonderful attitude of sharing. So these are our friends. These are, and several of these, many of these are, are, are members of the church. Uh, these kids are. This is a lady at the dedication of the facility. We had the missionaries come and, and we gave out copies of the Book of Mormon. And even members of the church don't all have copies of the Book of Mormon. And you can see how proud she is to have a book. And that book. So, okay. this is one of, the, one of the good old brothers. So, what we met were people with a lot of faith, bright smiles, and there's a bright future in Ghana. So, this is sort of our symbol, our image of Ghana. The, the, the beautiful colors, the workmanship, and taking off. They didn't blow away, but... No, they didn't. All right. All right, I want to share a few stories, lessons from Africa, things that we learned from the people who were there. And there's a great quote... I'm spinning around on this. <laughs> All right, there's a great quote by uh, Lucy Mack Smith, who lived in very similar conditions to the people in Ghana in the early 1840s, 1830s here in America. And she said this, uh, she was um, in her late 60s when she said this, and she said, we must cherish one another, and then, does it go from here? Watch over one another, comfort one another, and gain instruction that we may all sit down in heaven together. And I learned what this meant while I lived in Africa, in Ghana that year. So first, we must watch over one another. I want to show you some faces of some of my friends, the Ghanaian women, and how be look at their smiles. Look at how beautiful they are. Aren't they just amazing? There they are, coming to church. And I want to tell you the story of Sarah. This is Sarah, the midwife that Reed spoke about who was responsible for the health care of 25,000 people in the area where she lived. And she, she didn't have any help. She also didn't have any water, and she didn't have any electricity. So this is the road that we took to get to where Sarah lived, the road to Asut Soiree. These are the kids then. This is 10 years ago. I think this is hilarious. They have no idea I put this up here. <laughs> but this is uh, Lincoln, Rachel, and Dallin, and that's a termite mound. So we would stop as we were going out to the village. This is the village. And this is, as Reed said, this is someone carrying water. These women were so grateful when they were able to be given a plastic container. Because of, originally they had to carry the water in pottery on their heads. And then they were able to go to some tin buckets. So they were, in the morning, they would go and get the water the very first thing. And they would say, oh, I'm so, I'm so grateful. It's so easy to get water now because I have a plastic container for my water. There they are doing water. And this is Sarah going into the place where she took care of all of the people. This is where she delivered all the babies. This who is the were birthing born. bed. The birthing bed. She, um, there was a generator that sometimes produced some amount of electricity. So there would be some artificial lighting some of the time. But there wasn't any water. And I figured out of the 25,000 people who lived in this area around Sarah, probably 5,000 of them were women. And remember that infants die first from malaria. They can be gone in 24 hours. But pregnant women are the next most likely group to become really ill. And Sarah was responsible for all of them. So I brought this flashlight. I have to show you how she... Okay. So Sarah had no light. So if she was delivering a baby at night, she so calls... The, so the way the power works, the power 
is very inconsistent. The electricity is really inconsistent. You never know when it's going to be on. And most of the time up here in the it bush, isn't. it was not on. Most of the time when it got dark, it got dark. So, but babies didn't respect whether there was power or not. Babies so are not good about coming in the day. Delivering babies they in all the come at dark. night. Right. And so and Diane said, how? I said, Sarah, how do you do it when you don't have any light? And she said, oh, I use my torch. So she stuck a flashlight under her arm for light to deliver the children. Isn't that incredible? She was so glad to have it, you know. One of the first things we did was the boys, the boys had headlights. Some of you probably have them for reading at night, you know, the lights right there. She just thought that was incredible to be able to have the light on her head so she could see what she was doing. Anyway, no complaints. Let me go ahead. All right. This is one of the little boys who was waiting for his mother who was having a baby, and that's his little brother. The children take care of children because they have to. More of the children, seeing, they're seeing pictures of themselves. Rachel took a video of all of them. They've never seen themselves before. Look at their faces. And this, again, children taking care of children. This was his older sister. Look at his face. And it was hot, as you can see. So the people all took care of each other. When we first went there, the way they would do blood work, they used a broken tile to put the blood on to look at it under a microscope. They did everything they could to try to take care of each other. And they did it with a happy heart. It was quite remarkable. And this is Sarah and Rachel, who became very fast friends during that year that we were working. Isn't Sarah's face amazing? She never was too busy to take care of anybody who came that needed her help. And she was grateful for her work. She felt so lucky that she knew how to be helpful. And she felt like so many more babies were living since she was the midwife in that wonderful place. I want to tell you a story about comforting one another. So this is a group of people. Well, let me go, let me go forward to this map. All right. I don't know if you can see this. If I jump off, I'll never get up. Okay. So here is Ghana. This is where we were living. Can you show them a craw? I'm the laser pointer. The laser pointer. All right. This is Abidjan. This Which is, is the in capital the... of the Ivory Coast. Right. There is a war. It's my story, Reed. Oh. I mean, really? I'm... You speak, I'll do the visual. Right. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. So we're living a craw. Very well done. We're living in a craw. There is a temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in a craw. And... The people in the Ivory Coast, so Ghana is English speaking, the Ivory Coast is French speaking, and the country on the other side, Togo, is also French speaking. So, Burkina Faso, is the, everything around Everything it. around is French speaking. <clears throat> Can he stop talking? We don't know. <laughs> we ask ourselves. <laughs> All right. So, the people, uh, I want to tell you a story about the, the African people who were coming from the Cote d'Ivoire. While we were living there from Abidjan, there was a civil war between the Ivory Coast and Ghana. Nobody could cross the border. So in order for them to come, let me, get, let me see. Okay, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. In order for them to come, we received word that they were coming to the temple. The people from the Ivory Coast came once in their lifetime. They came, they all earned money. They gave money to different people to come each time they came. And you could come once and they would come into the temple, but they couldn't cross the border. So we received news that they were coming and they left Abidjan, but they couldn't cross. So they had to go all the way up through the Ivory Coast, all the way into Burkina Faso, and then all the way back down to Accra. So it's probably, I mean, this shows, you can't see, I'm here, it's like 30 mi 300 miles, so it was probably a 1,000-mile thousand, a thousand journey. They were on a bus. It was completely broken down. While they were coming, and no one had phones. We had no idea. There was just the word that they were coming. So day one, day two, day three. While they were on this bus, the bus broke down. They ran out of food and water. They had no money because they'd put all their money to getting to the temple, and finally, day three, day four, day five, are they coming? No one knows. Day six, has something awful happened? And the morning of day seven, about two or three in the morning, the bus arrived. Let me show you where they came. Here's the temple in Ghana. There it is. And they came about two or three in the morning, totally exhausted. The people who were there got up 
all the local people who were living close by got up, met them, helped them get cleaned up, helped them get ready. And when we came to the temple the next morning, about 7 a.m., they were all standing out front in their beautiful Sunday clothes. You saw the dress that they were wearing. Their beautiful Sunday clothes, singing, waiting for the temple to open. Let me show you. This is a, one of the families. This little boy had malaria, nearly died while they were there. There's another family, another family. Look at their faces, another family. They came in full of love, full of concern, one for another, taking care of everyone. The other amazing thing that happened, nobody knew when they were coming. So in order to open the temple, there had to be Ghanaian sisters and brothers who would be there to receive them. So that morning, about the time that they arrived, People started awakening, they had dreams, they had impressions that they should come to the temple. And they started walking, some at three in the morning, some later. They dressed and came into the temple and were there because they knew they were coming. No cell phones, no internet, but they felt impressed to know what they needed to do because they all lived very, very close to their Heavenly Father. They were totally dependent on Him, which is the way I think we're supposed to be. And these people were there for a week. They do all of the work for their family while they're there. You know, a normal thing, like for me, a normal thing when I meet someone, I say, oh, tell me about your family. So I said to one of the, one of the women, oh, tell me about your family. And she replied, God gave me four children, but they're all dead, which thing I had never heard. Another one, God gave me three children and one of them is still with me. God gave me this. God gave me that. No bitterness, just loving their family and wanting their family to be with them. So it was a remarkable experience of faith and also just the fact that everybody helped everybody else. They would stay for a week and then they would go home and then the next group would earn enough money that they could come. Okay. And the last. So, so while they're there, while they're there at the temple, essentially everybody is coming for the first time. Right. So when Diane and Rachel were working, the three of us were the only ones in the temple who spoke French. So we were kind of working with these French groups, when French speaking groups when they'd come. And Diane and Rachel, especially with, with, uh, with, with people coming through at the, at the beginning, and none of them had been there before. So if you've been to the temple and you imagine going through with a big group of people and no one's ever been there before. So Diane and Rachel were sort of doing it. In fact, the temple president who's giving instructions to the young men has a female translator. <laughs> so Rachel is translating to the young men for the temple president. And yeah. Diane is, and, and it, it was, it was like, it must have been at the very early days of the church. Yeah, it was great. Everybody is doing And that. I want to say, um, can I add one more thing? <laughs> Will you? Should so, you? Okay. So when, when we did ceilings, because everyone would come to be sealed together as families, almost all the time with families being sealed, even relatively young parents, some of their children would, they were already gone. would have already passed away. Yeah, they were already gone. So you're doing proxy sealings for children of living parents all the time. Yeah. And I was just going to say, you never know when, um, everything you do really counts in your life. You never know when you're going to use some of the uh, experiences that Heavenly Father has given you. And that was true in Africa because uh, we had all learned French earlier, um, about, I don't know, 10 years earlier, eh, eight or nine. Anyway, and uh, when we arrived there, then we found out that they didn't have anyone who could speak French to any of these people who were coming. So that was just a great, a, a great experience for us. Right, Reed, are you done? I also want to say that a lot of the no, little not. children... No, he's not done. Okay. A lot of the little children who would come into the temple, it was great because they had actually never seen anyone who was, had white skin 
before. And we terrified a lot of the children. I mean, eventually our friends in the temple would put us back in the coat room until they all came into the temple. And then, you know, so it wasn't a shock for them. It was just, they were the most wonderful, most incredible people, so faithful. So this is uh, my last thing I want to talk about is and gaining instruction. And this is uh, Florence. I want to tell you about Florence. What all the women did is they helped each other all of the time. She's so, walking away from me. Reed, I got to have a little space, you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, go, go. Anyway, all right. all right. So Florence. So the African, I'm going to tip right off on this. The African women all help each other all of the time. What they help each other to do is to learn skills so they can take better care of themselves and better care of their families. So Florence was one of my dear friends when we lived there. She lived pretty far outside of Accra. She would come in in the morning. She would ride the train in uh, a bus, like these amazing buses. But anyway, like, it's not like a bus like we think. They were incredible. Like Like a... A minivan, but it's carrying 12 people. Oh, or worse. Anyway, she would come in. She learned learned that she could clean. And then she learned through her work in the church that someone taught her how to cook. And then she found someone who had an oven. So she arranged that she would get up early, early, early. She would bake rolls. Then she would cook them in her friend's oven. And then... All right. And then she would sell them as she came into the city. So she, when she was going to work all day, helping to clean and do things. Just protecting Reed. you. What? <laughs> <laughs> there is going to be trouble. That's all I can tell you. All right. So I want to tell you, I mean, the wonderful thing was the sisters helping each other all the time at church on Sunday, there'd be a sacrament meeting. Then the sisters would all go to learn English or to increase their language skills. English was their third or fourth language. So they would practice, and then during Relief Society, they would share their skills. What did you learn this week? What did you learn? What what skill? How can we help each other learn to do things better? They were constantly learning. They were so humble. They never felt like, well, I I couldn't do that kind of work, right? They were just doing everything they could to help each other. Look at her. And um, this is someone else I wanted to tell you about. This woman's name is Deanne, and she was there. She uh, came from Salt Lake City. She was diagnosed with stage four cancer before she ever came. And she wanted to do something to help Heavenly Father's children before she died. So she came with her family. This is one of her good friends, one of our good friends who was there. But look at her face. She taught primary. Wonderful thing. I have to show you this. In church, anytime, and in school too, if someone did it, anytime someone gave a talk or said a prayer, all the children would give them a round of applause. They would do this. At the end of it, so you're, they go this, like this. All the children together. And like someone prays, everyone claps, you know. And anything that they did, it was so great in school. So the kids are just like, I mean, they have, they just are so confident and they have such a great feeling about themselves because everything they do, they give, they receive an applause for what they're doing. But what Deanne did was she gathered together all of her sisters and she taught them skills. She taught them I'm going to show you pictures of some of the things they were doing. She taught them how to get cloth and dye it. She taught them how to cut the cloth. She taught them how to sew things out of the cloth. She taught them how to make beads. She did this even in her own home. She had, her whole house was just full of everybody working all day long. Then she would invite friends from the local international school to come and buy the things from the people who had learned how to make them. So they had a source of revenue and a source of income. So this is a sewing machine. It's run with pedals. Remember, no electricity, no running water. The sun comes up at 6, it sets at 6. At 5.55, it's light as day. At 6 o'clock, it's dark as night. We're right on the equator. So uh, this was Esther who learned how to weave baskets. Aren't they beautiful? And she didn't have a place to sell them, so she hung them on a tree. She was so smart, she hung them close to the British embassy, knowing that the people would be driving back and forth at night. It was very, very lucrative. That worked well. People would go home with enormous amounts of baskets. Look, this woman is selling bananas. We bought all of our, we mo- bought almost all of our food on the street. So she's going to a place where she can sell bananas uh, for the day. And that's her plastic bucket for water. Okay. How about this one? Pillows. Isn't that incredible? They're so strong. Cloth, the beautiful cloth. Wood, they bring in. This is a typical market where they sold. And do you see the woman's, the baby on the back of the woman? 
So they always, had the, they always had the newest baby on their backs. Their hands were free, children other places, while they were doing, going, helping, never complaining. No one, as I said, ever went hungry. If there wasn't enough food, someone would make a bowl of rice, and everyone was welcome to it, and then they would fill up on water. Everybody watched over everybody else. Whoops, there we go, the market. I went the wrong way. More people taking, this is a special kind of uh, corn. They're ta- the women taking to the market. Look at the kids helping. Family affair. This woman's selling uh, on the street. She's selling her bananas and mango. Do you love that there's a, is it a Cebu? I mean, you know, it's a street. Who isn't crossing in the morning, right? So um, these are the things I learned from being there. I learned what it meant to cherish. Cherish means that you think lovingly about someone, that you have hope for someone's life. That's what they were doing. They watched over one another. They comforted one another. They kept learning. And all they cared about was helping everyone because there was no competition. You know, in the Book of Mormon at the very end and fourth, Nephi talks about how it was a time of no competition. So that means like no ODAC, I suppose. I don't know what it means. I mean, there probably weren't sports teams, right? But also, it just meant among the people. There wasn't a sense that if I get here, I'm going to get here ahead of you. It was, let's all go home together. Let's all get back together. What have you learned? What do you know? What can you teach me? What can we share? And everybody was safe home, without exception. And I can say that we never have lived, probably until here, among a happier people. So it was just an incredible experience for us to have this chance to be with such great people and to learn from their examples. Did I go long? They put up a brand new clock in the back. You should see it. And they made it huge so I can see it. All right, here you go. All right. We'll see. I, sh- I want to say one thing. I'm having trouble. This is an aside. Okay. So this is... No, no, no. I'm joking. Kind of. Anyway, this is an aside that um, I'm having trouble with my eyes, so I can't... Even though I have glasses... I can't really see. So I can't see your faces. So if I don't wave to you or I don't call out your name or something, please know that I really care about you and that, please, if you speak to me, I'll know who you are. Uh Right? I know you. All right. And um, I just wanted to say that so you would never think I'd walk by you and not be friendly or not call out to you. So forgive me till my eyes get better. Okay. Let's go. Read. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned to you that we wanted to do this project and in particular the rest of the family did because I was pretty involved with, with the work at the university, uh, the research, the medical research. So we actually did a couple of projects. One we called the Volta Village Project, which was essentially raising money to create a rural medical laboratory and maternity clinic in the village of Asitswari. And there, there are a number of reasons why that was important. In order to get treatment for even something like malaria, there must be a diagnosis. The diagnosis depends on a lab. So there is reasonably good medical health in terms of getting medicine, but you can't get the medicine unless you can get a diagnosis. The closest place for all these people, these 25,000 people in all of this area, was a long walk, like 12 miles, to, to where there were the closest laboratory was. If you're sick, you can't walk 12 miles. And if you are very sick with malaria, you can't possibly. People don't have cars. So people didn't get treatment. So this was to build that lab. And, and basically, the kids, Rachel did filming. All, everybody did a lot of work on this, raised the money. And what you're going to see is this center being built in this village of Asitswari. And then there was a dedication. They said, let's do a dedication. They had a member of parliament come, whom you'll see in, in a, sort of a saffronish, brownish sort of robe. The regional head of the National Health Service came, a woman who had just finished a PhD in London. The head of the, the university uh, a, a man with glasses, a handsome man with glasses that I worked with every day was there. You'll see all these people there, and then you'll see the the people of the village. You'll see at one point there's kind of a ribbon cutting ceremony, and there's a there's a, a lady in a in a 
sort of pinkish flowered dress. She is the queen mother. The queen of the mother. Village. Is that great? The queen mother's in charge of the village. That's why things go so well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is what we're going to do to complete it. So this is the town. He stepped in. These are brothers and sisters. Yeah. They're great people. And 
one of the things we learned is that they have very little and they do everything with it. That's right. And one of the things we love about being here is that we feel the same spirit here at the school. We feel like this is a place where people are watching over each other, comforting each other, helping each other to learn, you know, and that we're all in this together and everyone's helping lift and take good care of each other. It's why SVU works. It's why you're all here. It's why we all feel really great about being here. And we thank you for everything that you're doing to make it work. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.